In this video, I'm going to tell you about the three main mistakes that I've made in the past that I'm going to try my utmost to avoid in the upcoming 1000 km brevet that we are going to do next weekend. Jermaine still has made a final decision as to whether she's actually going to ride the 1000 km brevet. Please put some encouragement for her in the comment section and let's try to get her motivated to actually get on the road and actually do this 1000 km brevet. Now I'm pretty new to randoneering and I did my first randoneer in 2019 and this is 2022. I only did my first super randoneer series last year and last year I did something that I felt was going to help me prepare for this year. What I did last year was I decided to go ahead and do my own individual long distance ride. So it wasn't an official randonne, it wasn't an official brevet, but it was just my attempt at actually breaking that psychological and physical barrier. So what I did was something that I call the border to border challenge in Saskatchewan. And if you have some idea of the geography of Western Canada, Saskatchewan is a province that is rectangular in shape and we about two thirds down the length of Saskatchewan and on either side is, are two other provinces. On the west is Alberta and on the east is Manitoba. I started off in Saskatoon and I rode all the way out to Alberta and then I came back that same evening. I rode out to Manitoba the next day and I came back the day after that back to Saskatoon as my own uh, experience. So this was totally an unregulated ride. It wasn't a brevet, it was just my way of trying to overcome the anxiety and stress of actually riding long distances. But what it was, it was an absolutely valuable experience in terms of learning and preparing for the official brevets. And that's what I'm going to try to draw on. I'm going to look at the three main mistakes that I made in that event, and I'm going to try and avoid those in this upcoming uh, 1000 kilometer brevet. So the first thing that I did was, I did not have enough sleep before the event. You know, most of us think that you have to actually have enough sleep during the event to be successful, and that's true. But if you actually, it's actually during the build up to the event that the sleep is absolutely so essential. Let me tell you a little bit more about my sleep uh, schedule during the actual long distance ride. So what I did was I, I divided my ride into essentially three seconds. Well, this is the Alberta border. I left Saskatoon just after midnight on the day of the first segment and I intended to ride to Alberta and back and be back by about midnight of the same day. So that's about 530 kilometers in about 24 hours. My sleep interval that I anticipated to do was going to be about four to five hours and after that I would then uh, embark on my second segment and my second segment would be then to ride to the Manitoba border and then sleep just in a city just after the Manitoba border for a distance of just more than 500 kilometers and then have another sleep of about four to five hours and then ride the last segment back which is just more than 350 kilometers or so. I calculated using that formula that I have been working on so it'll be 24 hours plus about four hours of rest which give me a total time of about 28 hours in the first segment the 24 hours with another four hours of rest will give me another 28 hours so that the first two segments in total would give me a total of about 56 hours and, and then I'll try to do the final segment of about 300 kilometers in about 14 to 16 hours so that I would be pretty close to a total riding time for the entire three segments of about 70 to 72 hours but what my biggest problem was was that I did not sleep adequately on the night preceding the start of the first segment so what actually happened was I finished work usual time five o'clock I just uh, took my bicycle rode from work about 200 meters down the road to the Holiday Inns. Stayed at the Holiday Inns that night because that is gonna be my base for my first uh, segment. And I, I tried to get into bed and have a good sleep from about seven till 12. I was hoping for five hours of sleep, but I think it was just the anxiety and the stress of the whole situation. My first time going to ride this long distance, I just didn't sleep. I probably slept for about half an hour, maybe an hour, uh, but it was not good quality sleep. So what essentially happened was that it meant that the day before the start of the first segment, I was essentially up for about 18 hours. And then I went to ride for 24 hours. So in fact, I was actually awake for 42. So essentially I was up for about 42 hours altogether uh, in the first segment. 
and then from 42 hours i then slept for four hours and what i found was that when i actually started riding the second segment from saskatoon to the manitoba border i was just way too exhausted i just couldn't do it um, i actually fell asleep on the side of the road i just had to stop my bicycle and just rest even though conditions were perfect but i was just so exhausted i couldn't actually ride and so instead of riding more than the 500 kilometers i could only ride about 300 kilometers just to the major city of yorkton i was really quite deflated because it took me an enormously long time to get to York and I think I only got there at about six or seven o'clock at night and what I decided was you know I'm gonna just forget about that schedule the the calculation that I had made was you know obviously not going to work because I had already lost so much time because I didn't sleep properly and I couldn't ride adequately I decided well I'm just gonna to go to the hotel check in you know have a change of clothes uh, do my laundry in the hotel and then you know sleep as much as I want to and then just complete the rest of the ride as best I could just to make sure that I could actually do something like this Then I was up again at about four back on the road by four o'clock in the morning but I felt so much better because I actually had about at least four to five hours of solid sleep at this stage I then entered into my third segment what I did was I rode towards the Manitoba border. I met a friend along the way, uh, Blair, and thank you so much, Blair, for being there. Hey, so I'm here with uh, Blair. We're at the border of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, it's about seven o'clock in the morning on Saturday. I think it's the 26th today. And uh, Blair's just accompanied me down from Churchbridge. We're gonna take a, a ride back with a little bit of a headwind. And I just wanna say, Blair, thank you so much for coming giving me this uh, nice track and uh, look forward to the ride back. All right, it's an awesome day for riding. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, but I felt fresh enough to be able to, to ride there. And then I just decided, you know, might as well just ride back to Saskatoon. And so I completed the entire event. I managed to complete it within about 76 hours. So I was about six hours longer than what I was hoping to do. But the main reason that I did not get my goal of 70, 70 hours was that I didn't sleep enough in the night before. Sleeping before the segment is absolutely crucial and that's the most important thing I think. Your build up to the actual long distance ride, you've got to make sure you have enough sleep because during the ride you have so much sleep deprivation that it's definitely going to impact your performance. So when we start the 1000 kilometer on Friday, I'm going to try and make sure that night before I go to bed at at least about 7 o'clock at night and try to sleep till 12 or 1 o'clock then be up by 2 o'clock get ready because i anticipate that our brevet will probably start at 4 a.m and then we're going to be on this on the road for at least 24 hours before our next race a second mistake that i made was essentially my choice of bicycle i'm really fortunate in that over the years i've accumulated a variety of different bicycles you know i race with what we call a specialized tarmac which is a really lightweight very responsive very aerodynamic really fast bicycle i have a roubaix and then i've got a diverge which is a gravel bike and these two bikes are slightly heavier and they don't have as much of a responsive feeling and they're just not as quick as what i find when i ride the tarmac so in my inexperience i decided well because i'm going to be pushing the limit on this uh, border to border ride i'm going to go with my fastest bike and so I chose my tarmac. In retrospect, that was just the wrong choice because the bike geometry, first of all, is not set up for long distance. So what I found was that I was a lot more hunched over. And so I started to get a lot of neck pain as well as back pain. I got some sciatic nerve pain with pain going down my legs. I also found that I spent a lot of time in the hunched over position. So I started to get some paresthesia and numbness in my hands. And that numbness lasted for up to three months afterwards. So it was quite significant nerve damage. Also got severe uh, paresthesia in the feet or what they call hot foot at one stage I just couldn't continue riding because my feet were just so painful and hot and burning that I had to get them out of the shoes and what I did was I actually pedaled with my feet on top of the shoes um, just to give them some relief I also had these deep section Rovell wheels I think there were 65 millimeter uh, deep sections with a 26 millimeter tire and it was super fast there was no doubt about it but the problem i found with this was that i found every single bump along the way and it's maybe fine for your first 100 kilometers you know you can go flat out and absorb all those vibrations and bumps but by the time you get to 900 kilometers or a thousand kilometers those bumps and vibrations start to take their toll 
and so in the last 300 kilometers of my ride I really suffered also the 26 millimeter tires are once again great for short distances but I think on long distances where we're riding through the night as well as riding on really bad surfaces because Saskatchewan is a province that has extreme weather conditions and so the road surfaces are very often severely damaged and there's lots of potholes. What I found was that I had multiple punctures with these 26 millimeter tires as well as the impact of riding out through all these obstacles uh, eventually destroyed my rear wheel bearings. Um, I knew my wheels were completely shot at the end of the ride. They were completely loose. There was just so much play in the, the, the wheel and I really thought that the wheels were completely, you know, a write-off. I took them into my local bike store, Bruce's Cycle Works, and it's perfect again. But it was quite a costly exercise and there was always the potential that I could have ruined the, the wheels completely. My choice for the next 1000 kilometer brevet is going to be my gravel bike, the Specialized Diverge. And with the Specialized Diverge, I have upgraded all the components to match exactly that that I had on the Specialized Tarmac, as well as the wheel set I'm going to use that can accommodate a wider tire. And I'm going to be riding tires that are at least 32 millimeters wide. I've been riding them so far in the shorter brevets and they've been excellent in terms of way through potholes and irregular surfaces or sharp objects. They're very resilient for, to punctures and they absorb the vibration and the impact extremely well. So I'm hoping that with this, it's gonna be you know, a much more consistent ride with less stoppages for repairs. And at the same time, greater reliability of the equipment. Hopefully I won't have any broken wheels. And I'm hoping that I'll have less uh, fatigue in the body because my body will have less vibrations to absorb. The third mistake that I made was my selection of food. In rural Saskatchewan, the availability of services is extremely scarce. You know, during the day, you know, they, they don't have as many fast food outlets and restaurants that you're able to buy during the day. And at night, they're almost non-existent. So what I did was I would stop at every town where I knew that there is going to be a fast food outlet. One that I found most reliably in most of these towns was the fast food outlet that's, that provides these footlong sandwiches. And so I tried to eat a footlong sandwich at almost every town that I could stop at. And wherever I stopped, I would always buy a second foot long and put that into my back pocket. And just in case the next one was actually closed or I wasn't able to find one, especially at night. So I accumulated a lot of foot long sandwiches, but it was so hot that these foot long sandwiches didn't survive the journey. They became spoiled really quickly. Because of that, I started to eat a lot more foods that were uh, less complex in terms of carbohydrates such as chips and chocolate. These of course didn't give me the amount of energy that I needed and I think some of that may have contributed to the extreme fatigue that I felt during the second stage and performed so poorly. What I'm going to do this time is that I've been trying out the recommendation that this has been made by another friend of mine, Ed Dilsner. He's recommended that I make I take pre-made sandwiches and these sandwiches are just bread with butter and cheese and I've been trying these on the 300 and 400 and 600 kilometer brevets and they seem to work really well so I make individual sandwiches put them in, in uh, sealed packages and pack them into my little burrito bag the little burrito bag on my frame which has been uh, made by another friend Paul Cutting and this is ideal because I can put them all into this little burrito bag. I know exactly how many there are. I can open it up and have a look and just keep a count as to how much food I've got. And these sandwiches last the entire journey. They don't ever spoil. And even in the heat, the cheese just gets softer. The bread becomes more moist. It's also easy to eat on the go so I can actually eat without having to stop. And then when I get to, to the checkpoints, I'm hoping that I'll spend less, less time purchasing food for this purpose. So I'm hoping that Jermaine will to actually join me on this 1000 kilometer brevet. Once again, as I say, if you want to see her ride this 1000 kilometer brevet, please put a message of encouragement in the comment section. Let her know that you want to see her on the road. Until the next video, cheers.